Lord. Praise God. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord and worshiping. The last couple of weeks I was on call and I was unable to attend. Um, I thank the Lord for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, we will continue from the, the book of Acts that we've been studying lately. We're going to go into chapter 6, but before we get into it, as a way of introduction, if you are remembering correctly, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord Jesus gave the great commission that you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we can see that they were all in one accord, which speaks to their unity. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see that they were continuingly steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of the bread and prayers. And then to add on to that in 2, verse 44, they said they were together and had all things in common. And in chapter 4, verse 32, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul and mind. Therefore, the church was united in its pursuit and purpose of God's plan. And the church, as uh, talked about in Ephesians, is analogous to the body of Christ given by Paul in Ephesians. And therefore, the church was working in unison. And now in chapter 6, they're coming up against a division. And today, I'd like to uh, expound on the first seven verses of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 1 through 7, if you could turn to that. I'll read it in the ESV. In a sermon titled, Exponential Growth. Exponential Growth. And so, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But he, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of spirit and of the Holy, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a prostitute from, of Antioch. These were set before the apostles, and they prayed there, and laid their hands on them. And the word of the Lord continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this word that you have uh, going to speak to us through. Lord, many times before there is a great multiplication, there needs to be a, 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 a persecution, Lord. Many times we're not understanding of that. We don't know your plans, but we know that you are in sovereign control over everything. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was giving in my introduction, there was great unity in the church. We know that there were additions to the church. We know 3,000 people were added in chapter 2. And then again in chapter 4, it said 5,000 men were added to the church. So we know the church at this time was maybe tens of thousands of people. And now there are complaints. Even in the first century church, there is a complaint or a concern. And there's two sides to it. There is the Hellenists, let me explain that for the children. Uh, Hellenists is the Greek uh, Jewish people, the Jewish people that were foreigners that came from uh, Greek uh, cultures and had come for the Passover. And because of all that was happening and the church that was taking place there, they decided to stay and they decided to worship. And then there is, of course, the Hebrews, which are the Jewish uh, the Israelites, the Jewish people that belong to Israel. And so there's two groups with two gripes. And we see that their gripes included many things, including uh, possibly two different languages. We know that the Jewish people spoke in Aramaic, and here the Hellenists spoke in Greek. Uh, they had two different value systems or moral systems that they came from because of their background. And now they are together worshiping. 
They had two different cultures, and now they are both followers of Christ. We see that there's two sides, even in the first century church, and they had differences in language, differences in value systems, differences in cultures, but both were Christians, and that caused a conflict between them. And you see, do you see any comparisons to that? You know, I won't go into details, but if you look at uh, the church, you have maybe uh, the youth that say, oh, my parents have a different culture system, or they have a different language, or there might be different political opinions in the church, uh, but there are always differences. But how did the first century church uh, handle this? Let's look at that. The main complaint was that the widows were be being neglected in the daily distribution or uh, in the daily ministry. So if you study this portion, even though the NIV says that it was the daily distribution of food, if you look in the King James Version, it says it's the daily ministration. And in the Greek, that means trape trapezii. So uh, you can interpret it as food, like it says in NIV. So all of these people were of one mind, one accord, and we see earlier that they were all eating, uh, eating together. They considered everything in common, and so it is possible that the Hellenist Jews, the Greek-speaking, the foreign Jews, felt isolated, and they felt like the food distribution was not being equal, and that was one beef. The second was that, uh, that waiting on tables has an implication as well. And even if you go to Greece right now, if you look at a bank, it says trapezii. So that waiting on the tables could also mean money or a bank or the fund that is being administered. So there is a possibility that the Hellenists or the foreign Jews felt as if the money that was being allocated out uh, was, not, was not being done fairly and was not given in a proportion to the Greeks, but more to the Jewish or Hebrew uh, widows. And then there's another Bible scholar who says that the ministry uh, had, uh, when it talks about waiting on the table, it had more to do with ministering in their language. Uh, the people that were uh, foreigners in the land of Jerusalem, the, the Greek-speaking Hellenists, uh, did not have uh, an equal part in understanding the ministry that was going on. We see that the people would get together in the temple courts and also in homes, and they would usually speak in Aramaic and not in the native language of uh, the people, the Hellenists, which was Greek. And so we see the problem that is taking place there. There is a, 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 a complaint, a gripe that the people that are Greek-speaking has against the Aramaic-speaking Hebrews. And we see that uh, the apostles... Uh, came up with a solution. We see that they summoned all the leaders, which says the full number of disciples. So there were uh, many, many, th as I said, tens of thousands of people that had been saved and baptized into the church. So there were many, many house churches that were taking place at that time. And they called the leaders of all the cells, and they called all the full measure of the disciples, and they said uh, something that was profound. It is not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. See, we need to focus on prayer and word is what the apostles said. And so we come to a, a point here where we learn about the different uh, parts of ministry in the church. We see the apostles who are now uh, the pastors uh, in today's society saying that we need to focus upon prayer and the word of God and the ministry of the word of God. Therefore, we cannot uh, divert ourselves into taking after things like food or money or, uh, or many things like that. So what did they do? They said, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And then they started to delegate. We know that uh, there is many different roles in the church. And we see that here in the first century church as well. We see that the, the apostles could not take care of this and be true to the word of God and the study of the word of God. And it is, that is why in the modern church as well, we have many different positions. Uh, as the children of God, we are part of the body of Christ. The, the head is Christ 
and the nervous system is the Holy Spirit, but every part of the, uh, that's connected to, to the head. So every, every other part has a different role. And so if I were to come up here and start singing, all of you would walk out of the, the, the sanctuary because that is, not, uh, that is not my role. And so, um, that is, uh, that, that, so everyone needs to understand their role and know what, uh, what the Holy Spirit is leading them to. And uh, there is delegation by the apostles. And we see that all of them were in unison deciding who the seven men should be. We see that uh, in the human body, there's the eyes, there is the mouth, there's the head, the feet. And imagine if uh, one said that, you know, because I'm not the eye, I won't do my task, then you cannot move forward. So we've talked about this in the book of Ephesians, and we've uh, done a sermon on this in the past. So uh, the, in verse 4, the apostles are saying, we need to give our whole attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And we see that pastor uh, gave his testimony a few, few weeks ago that he spends hours be, be behind each sermon on Monday and Tuesday. And then uh, after sending it, he has to prepare it. And, and in the same way, the pastors uh, and, the, and the ministers, the apostles, have to spend time in prayer and the ministry of the word. But then there is a group that is needed for the welfare of the church, for the food, the ministry, the money, and the various other uh, things that needs to take place in the church. And that was delegated out to seven people. Seven people were chosen. And the first among them was a man named Stephen. Stephen is uh, a Greek man. He was a man, it says, that was in the, in the various uh, scripture portions. Uh, in that portion that we read, it says he was a man full of faith. He was a man uh, that was full of spirit. Well, later we see that he was a man full of grace. So Stephen was a unique man that had a good reputation. And that is one of the requirements. And when we go to sec uh, Timothy, we can see the requirements of an overseer and of a deacon and various other roles and responsibilities. But we see the testimony of Stephen. And then they chose Philip, the evangelist, who we'll learn about a little bit more uh, in the coming weeks. And, and we'll learn more about Stephen as well in the coming weeks. But let me start off uh, by saying some things about Stephen. Do you all know, Steve, do you know what your name means? Steve? Uh, Stephen is derived from the Greek word Stephanos, which means it is a wreath or a crown that is laid around the head. It is uh, like a victor's crown. And by extension, it also means reward or honor or fame. So the word Stephen meant that he had a wreath or a crown, or you can call Corona if you want a crown. And so uh, there, he, that was the name of Stephen. And so what did Stephen though had to do in the next chapter? If you look at Stephen, you see that he had to put down his own life. He had to put down his own crown. And then he was able to see the Lord Jesus waiting for him uh, on the right hand of the Father. And he only not only was sitting, but he was standing to receive Stephen. Stephen was able to receive the victor's crown truly. And we see the analogies of Stephen and the Lord Jesus in many, many things, including the grace that he had to say at the end, Lord, forgive them for they not know, know not what they do. And so Stephen uh, is the first that is mentioned, but there is Philip who was also mentioned and he was important in the ministry and was an evangelist that took the word of God to Judea and to Samaria. And so uh, we see a rapid multiplication, it says in verse 7, and there was a rapid increase because of this. A few things again I want to point out here. These seven men that were chosen to deal with this problem were all Greek-speaking men to deal with a problem that affected the Greek-speaking world, uh, the Hellenist widows. And so they were able to minister to these uh, Greek-speaking widows and to the Greek-speaking uh, Jews at large. And uh, they were able to minister in both food, uh, money, and also in word. And we see Stephen's great sermon in chapter 7. That one sermon is thought to be uh, affecting the change of the person who had let the death of Stephen take place, which is Paul. And so Paul was able to get a history from the very beginning of Abraham all the way till the end. And because of that, there was also the gospel going not only 
to Judea and to Samaria. But later in the chapters, we'll see Paul is the one who takes the gospel to Europe and to Asia. And so because of this man, Stephen, who was only able to do one sermon, only one sermon, and we don't see anybody, it doesn't say thousands of people were added to the church. It does not say that. But he was able to gain the victor's crown. He was able to see the heavens open and the Lord Jesus standing up to receive him. He was able to uh, receive uh, or go into the presence of the Lord as he was preaching and he was being stoned. So before a multiplication happens, before there is a rapid increase sometimes, there needs to be a scattering. And in the last part of chapter uh, 7 and the beginning of chapter 8, we see after the death of Stephen, there was a great fear among the people and there was scattering of everyone except for the apostles. And then we see because of that, the word of God was taken out of Jerusalem. Until this point, it was only in Jerusalem. And it was taken to Judea and to Samaria by Philip. And then later, Paul was converted and had the road to Damascus moment. And we see that he was able to take it to the known world at that time. So uh, in this particular portion, I wanted to point out a few things again. There was a problem in the first century church. But they looked at their priorities and they came up with a proposal. And that, that, when they analyzed that, they involved everyone's participation. And they came forward with a plan to choose these seven men who were not just men to serve tables, but men that were full of the Holy Spirit and faith and full of grace. And we see a couple of examples of them, but the rest of them are not really talked about in the Bible, about Nicanor or Timon or the rest of them. But all seven were Greek speaking and was able to minister to the widows and that problem was able to be solved. Now we know this famous uh, saying and I think it uh, goes back to AD uh, 200s or so by the early uh, Christian author um, Tertullian that says the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. If you look at the life of Stephen um, he was maybe prepared for none, nothing else but to speak this one sermon. And because of this one sermon, he was able to uh, spread the gospel. And there was a multiplication of the gospel all around the known world because of it. And so that we see that there is a great uh, exponential growth that happens. But before this exponential growth took place... There had to be a martyr, and the first Christian martyr is Stephen. You know, martyr is named after Justin Martyr, uh, and it's uh, from, I think, the 280 or so that is called a martyr. So it was not known as a martyr at that time, but he died for the gospel. He died after his first sermon, that sermon that was able to change the heart of, or put the seed in the heart of Paul that became the greatest evangelist the greatest apostle that was able to take the gospel to all around the world. As the uh, worship team is coming up, let me uh, uh, finish off with a few thoughts. Let me read a, um, a song by Steve Green. Steve Green, you all know Steve Green. In dark, filthy places, forsaken, forgotten, our brothers and sisters are paying a price. They will not deny him to purchase their freedom. For these are the faithful, the martyrs of Christ. Twisted and broken, abandoned and beaten, their bodies confined, an unseen sacrifice. But deep in their spirits, they know perfect freedom. For they are the ones who've been set free truly by Christ. From under the altar, the voices are crying, How long, Lord, till you come to judge the earth? But he'll wrap and redeem them in robes of pure white. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The deafening silence, their faithful refusal to doubt or to deny in the presence of man. They live by his promise before his own father that in his kingdom he will not deny them. How long, Lord? How long till you come again to take us home? 
and he'll wrap and redeem them in robes of pure white. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I know many of us are confused with what's going on around the world. And so um, sometimes God has a special plan and a purpose that does not make sense to the human eye. And um, I would say get ready Get ready uh, for persecution. Get ready to be martyrs, even in America. Uh, and uh, uh, the Lord may have a plan and a purpose behind it. And uh, it is the seed of the martyrs that is able to be the fertilizer for the uh, gospel to be spread. And Stephen became the catalyst. He was able to catapult the gospel outside of Jerusalem and take it to Judea, which was the commandment in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, to take it to Judea, to Samaria. And then he was able to show his life to Paul who consented to his stoning. And because of, of the conversion that Paul had, he was able to take it to Europe and to Asia. And if you ask Stephen, Stephen, uh, how foolish are you maybe that you're only speaking one sermon and then you're being stoned to death. But Stephen has to say one answer that yes, I am being killed in this one sermon that I'm preaching. But the seed of my death is going to be the reason that the gospel is catapulted to the rest of the known world. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that. May God bless you all with these words.